When I started this channel, one of my tenets were to shine a light on manufacturers that wouldn't ordinarily get a lot of recognition. Well, today is one of those days where I get to do exactly that. Tim Narramore is an electronic engineer based in Dorset, England. He originally started his career in the aerospace industry, but spent most of his working life as a software engineer and system integrator in the telecoms industry. For 30 years, Tim has been tinkering with amplifier design as a hobby. He eventually developed it to a point where he felt he had something rather special. And in 2018, more amps was incorporated. The Angel series of amplifiers are named after Tim's favorite demo track by Willie and the Bandits. Tim Narramore has spent those years investigating the principles behind passive pre-amplifiers, low negative feedback, and the importance of power supplies. There are quite a few manufacturers of high-end amplifiers that over the years have elected to go down the zero or low negative feedback route in the pursuit of Sonic Nirvana. Accuphase is short for accurate phase, and they have low feedback circuits in their design. Since 1999, Luxman's amplifier circuits feed none of the original audio input back to the main amplifier module. Their new Z series replaces the previous X series and features Luxman's integrated feedback engine system, claiming to refine the design and reduce distortion by 50%. Dan D'Agostino manufactures some exquisite but very expensive amplifiers with no feedback. Many of Griffin Audio's amplifiers, including their new flagship Apex Power Amp, have zero global negative feedback. I think you get the picture. That's some exotic company. Time to take a closer look at the More Angel preamp and the Angel 4 Power Amp. A slim full rack width unit, the More Angel preamp weighs three kilograms or 6.6 .6 pounds. It will set you back £2,795 at a couple of dealers in the UK where it's currently available. Controls couldn't be simpler. Attenuation of volume is achieved by a motorised Alps volume control. It takes a little time to mentally adjust to having to turn the volume dial round more than usual, as this is a preamplifier without voltage gain. Thankfully, it's silky smooth and usable through its range. On the other side of the illuminated logo are a series of buttons to select between four line level inputs, a unity gain input to integrate with AV systems, a tape loop to connect recording devices, and a mute standby button. It also comes with a billet aluminium remote control, which is reassuringly heavy and has the essential functions. On the rear, you can change the preamplifier from floating to fixed ground to help eliminate ground loops if you have source equipment that can cause hum. You'll also see a bank of RCA connectors for the four inputs, tape loop and home theatre bypass that I mentioned. There are single ended and XLR balanced outputs to connect to different power amplifiers. The matching Angel 4 power amp is the same width as the Angel preamp, but naturally more substantial, weighing 18 kilograms or 39.7 pounds. It's a class AB amplifier delivering 75 watts into eight ohms and double into four ohms. The Angel 4 will set you back 4,995 pounds. The rear is almost as simple as the front with one set of RCAs to deal with the signal coming in and one set of speaker terminal posts to deal with the signal coming out. Oh, there is a trigger cable that you can connect between the pre and the power amps so that both units will simultaneously go into standby via the remote control. Unfortunately, I can't open the box and show you the internals without the manufacturer's permission. But the general idea here is to use as few components in the signal path as possible and to use good quality parts to preserve the integrity of the signal. For example, I'm informed that the input switching relays have self-wiping contacts that shouldn't degrade over time and cost about 20 times the price of regular relays. The problem with passive preamps is that as the cables connected to them increase in length, the capacitance goes up and that can cause signal loss. It's the capacitance in cables that resist the tiny voltage changes in the signal itself. And that's why the Angel preamp has an active unity gain output stage to give it the ability to drive long cable lengths. Everything is low feedback, even the voltage regulators for the power supply. And there are two independent power supplies, one for the digital microprocessor controlling the system logic and the other for the analog audio side. 
Loudspeakers can be notoriously difficult to drive. Not only do amplifiers have to be able to handle the mechanical inertia of the drivers themselves, but also the back EMF that's generated. And that's due to the voice coil of the driver being in the presence of a permanent magnet. That causes two magnetic fields to interact with each other and generates that back EMF. And no, I'm not gonna do a demo of the voice coil moving. This is a family friendly channel. I'm sure you get the picture. That's basically the speaker resisting control and fighting back against the amplifier. This is where many solid state amplifiers have an advantage over valve designs due to a better damping factor and higher current capability, which allows them to control low frequencies better. However, valves are inherently more linear than transistors in open loop. That's before you apply negative feedback. Negative feedback is used to improve the linearity of an amplifier and lower distortion. 30 years of experimentation led Tim Naramore to believe that the amount of total harmonic distortion in an amplifier isn't an important consideration as long as it's below a certain threshold. The amount of intermodulation distortion is far more relevant. Now intermodulation distortion is, let's say you input two signals into a non-linear amplifier, 1000 Hertz and 5000 Hertz. You'd expect to get those two signals on the output, which you would, but you also get some additional frequencies generated, the sum and the difference, i.e. 4000 Hertz and 6000 Hertz. Those additional frequencies weren't there on the original input signal, and that's intermodulation distortion. Tim has designed each stage of his amplifiers to be as linear as possible to emulate a valve amplifier. The input and driving stages have very little excess gain, so require very little negative feedback. The impact, he believes, is a lack of muddiness in the sound, improved dynamics, and an opening of the sound stage. The output stage of the Angel 4 power amplifier has four ring emitter transistors per channel, chosen for their linearity in the crossover region. So in one transistor, hands a signal over to another transistor, the crossover region is in the middle. And that's the primary source of intermodulation distortion. The Angel 4 transistors are supposed to maintain linearity even when delivering high current. It has another trick up its sleeve as well. It has an optimal biasing circuit that monitors and compensates for temperature changes, ensuring sustainably low crossover distortion. Low feedback amplifiers have a problem. They're a lot more demanding of the power supply compared to high feedback amplifiers. And that's because they're less able to reject power supply fluctuations. The Angel 4 has two banks of capacitors, one to smooth the incoming mains and the other to deal with power supply fluctuations caused by supplying current to the loudspeaker. This should help it to maintain a stable reference voltage even as power is drawn from it. Well, all of Tim Naramore's tinkering over decades hasn't been in vain. The more Angel combo has stunning levels of transparency. That's a word that I don't use often or lightly, and I don't mean it in the literal sense. I wasn't present at any of the recordings, but I played through it. It's the excellent level of detail and the lack of coloration that draws me to that conclusion. There's no other amplifier that I've reviewed to date on this channel that has the ability to get out of the way of the music the way that the Angel Pre and the Angel 4 do. And I appreciate that some statement to make. Playing one of my favorite jazz numbers, Midnight Special by Jimmy Smith, I had to marvel at how well placed his organ was, the clarity and timbre of Stanley Tarantine's saxophone, and how beautiful Donald Bailey's hi-hats fell away. Everything tonally and in terms of detail with these amplifiers is so correct. The transient attack of a note, the body, that's the middle, and the way that they decay. And you're not gonna trip them up with vocals either, but it's not perfect. I put on Hans Zimmer's Gotham's Reckoning from the Dark Knight Rises soundtrack and appreciated the Angel Combo's grip and control of low frequencies, but the impact of the big symphonic drums came off as polite. That track has a vast soundstage and dynamic shifts that you only tend to get with classical recordings these days. The Angel Pre and Angel 4 did well, but the contrast between quiet and loud passages could be greater. The soundstage is deep, but could be a little bit wider for a pre-power combination at this price. Time for some comparisons. If you have something like a Hegel H190 and are shopping for an upgrade, you won't get a wider canvas or greater dynamic thrills with the more combo, but in terms of clarity, control, 
depth of field and overall musical insight, they're not close. My Exposure 21 Pre and 18 Super Monoblocks best the Angel Duo when it comes to scale and dynamics, but they're also more coloured. That's an interesting comparison because if you put my vintage amps into an inflation calculator, they'll also come out at around about eight grand today. I'd miss the extra bass weight and soundstage width of my exposures, but in terms of clarity, lack of coloration, and control in the low frequencies, it's the more amps that generally come out on top. The Burson Soloist 3X GT preamps and Timekeeper 3X GT monoblocks are also similarly priced in the UK. They went back a while ago, but using my exposures as a common reference suggests that they're similarly resolving of detail, significantly drier in tonality, but perhaps a little bit more dynamic. The great thing about old school amplifiers like this is that they're pretty much connect and forget, so I'm not gonna extend things any further than it needs to be and get straight into partnering equipment. The front end source was my Orlick Aries Mini with MCRU power supply fed via I2S into my Denafrips Venus 2 DAC via the Denafrips Iris DDC. The Graham Audio LS6 speakers that I recently reviewed were first up, very accomplished floor standers for £3,333, tight, agile bass, clean, natural mids, but a little dark on top and ultimately not resolving enough to get the best out of the Angel Pre and Angel 4. My Proax revealed what these amplifiers are capable of in the middle and high frequencies in terms of preserving timbre and detail, but the more amps were held back a little bit by the limitations the 1SCs have in bass definition when put in a system at this level. The ATC SEM 40s are in for review, and it's with speakers at this level, about twice the price of my Proax, that the more Angel Pre and Angel 4 are likely to find a suitable home. Look out for the upcoming ATC SEM 40 review for how that combination fared. More amps are off to a great start with the Angel Preamp and Angel 4 power amplifiers. The level of transparency, that's that word again, is beyond any amplifier I've reviewed to this point. Some of you will expect more thrills and spills in terms of dynamics, soundstage, and kicking bass lines from amplifiers around this price. And that's fair enough, but if you're happy with all that stuff, perhaps you've got one of those 3,000 pound integrated amplifiers and you wanna take them up a level or two levels in terms of clarity, refinement, and natural presentation, you should check out the more Angel Pre and Angel 4 power amp. If you're fortunate enough to live somewhere where you can audition them, of course they get a highly recommended from this channel. Okay, I know for many of you outside the UK, these amplifiers aren't gonna be an option, but every brand has to start somewhere and you don't know where the future of this brand will lead. Perhaps a distributor somewhere near you may pick them up down the line. For me, it's just nice to veer off the beaten track sometimes. I hope you can appreciate that. And that got me thinking, what are the domestic or local brands in your area that you think show promise? Let me know about those in the comments section. I'm sure all of us like to find out about that. And if you can't think of any of those, just let me know what products you might be interested in me reviewing this year. I'll certainly give them some consideration. All that remains for me to say is if you like this video, you like what I'm doing with this channel, you wanna see it grow and you haven't done so already, please do all that social media stuff. Check me out on Patreon for consultancy services if you think I can help you with your audio journey. There's behind the scenes videos on there, as well as join the ABA club on Patreon where we have periodic video calls. But for today, for now, a British audiophile, signing off.